Hello, uh, my name is Ron, and I'm also known as Prognot. I've been doing these shows now almost four years, and I've been reviewing CDs for a lot longer than that. I had a hiatus between 2016 and uh, 2020. And joining me today is Scott of Ocean, Oceans of Night. And he has a new one out called Mindstorm. Oh, yeah, it looks familiar. <laughs> so you had a, a 10 year gap between the previous one and I, I just wanted to know what, why, I mean, was it personal reasons or just, did, you know, just thought 2024 was the right time? Yeah, I, I wish I could say it was the latter, but it's more of the former. You know, it's just, you know, we had a pandemic in there. You know, there's all sorts of other, you know, issues, economic. I mean, I, I, I kind of joked about it a little bit in the, uh, you know, in the liner notes of the, of the CD, you know, where I, I mentioned, um, you know, computer dysfunctionality, you know, inflation and software malfunctions and stuff, which isn't actually too far from the truth. And in fact, they're all part of the truth. But, um, you know, it's just a combination of things. And, you know, as you get older, time seems to get past, slip on bias a little bit faster than, than we intend or than we actually conceptualize sometimes. So it's also part of that is just, you know, time started going by. And uh, I, I didn't even realize it was 10 years until I was probably thinking about it consciously and I was writing the notes. I'm like, it really has been that long. And, um, you know, you know, it's also a matter of, you know, working with other musicians and getting things, you know, done to the level that you want them done at and, and making sure the quality is there. And, and even just simple things like recording the music and, and working with, you know, studio folks and engineers and producers and whatnot. So, you know, it's kind of a combination of a lot of different things that led up to, uh, I guess that big break in time, but, you know, finally I got it done. And so I was pretty happy about that actually. Well, you know, talking about uh, Mindstorm, I just got this uh, a few days ago, and I've been listening to it a lot. I haven't really found my favorite song yet, but I just like how it all flows together really nicely, because um, you don't really notice the, any breaks, you know. Yeah, I know it's it's somewhat new to you because you only had it for a little while. But you know, you hit on an interesting point there, Ron, with the uh, the song sequence because that's something that uh, I think not just me but a lot of musicians take into consideration when when we're doing full length projects where you know it's not based upon a single release or anything. So when you're doing these full length, whether it's an album or a CD or whatever, you know. The original intent is, of course, that people listen all the way through it, especially if it's not a concept album, but um, which this is not. But, you know, there's, there's common themes and just you get a certain, you know, flow with certain pieces when you listen to it straight away through at least, you know, a couple times, because obviously no one's going to listen to it from front to back every time. But I think that's an important thing that you brought up and that I actually always consider when I'm putting together like the, uh, the song order or the sequence of songs. So um, that is something that you really only get when you're doing that, when you're sitting down and just putting it on your headphones or your stereo system and just kind of riding the, um, taking the road as it goes in order. Right. So we'll start off with uh, the first track, um, Servants of Shadow and then uh, New Dawn. Yeah, that, gosh. Uh, originally that was supposed to have vocals to it, but I never could find the right melody or we could never work in vocals to it. So I kind of created it as a, uh, I, I put the guitar line in there to kind of make up for the vocals, but it, it worked nicely as an, as a uh, instrumental piece. And, and I think because it starts off in a very like cinematic and bold fashion, it, it really served as a good, you know, front piece to the, to the album. And so it has the, like that big cinematic quality with the sound effects. And then the song just kind of, you know, punching you in the face, so to speak. And then it's, you know, the first half of the song is, is kind of dark and mysterious. And that's why I, you know, the title shifts from um, 
you know, Servants of Shadow to New Dawn, because you get this modulation shift where the, the mood of the song changes too, from one of, of darkness and, and mystery and foreboding to one of, you know, of, uh, I, I guess it's a lot more a major, it's a major scale and it has a much more upbeat, uplifting sound. So that I thought was a good opening track and it was instrumental. Again, that's kind of what it turned out to be. And I was totally happy with that. And uh, so, you know, I think it kind of sets, sets the pace for uh, what's going to happen following that and the rest of the album where you're going to have these movements and these, you know, dynamics, dynamics, which just kind of, uh, you know, shift and, and change depending on the song, whether it's lyrical or an instrumental. So I think it just sets the tone for the, for the rest of the album. Yeah, it does. Um, when I listened to it, I thought, okay, this is, I mean, there's not, not many bands put out their instrumental as the opening. It's, you know, and it's, it's kind of cool that you kind of touch that way because uh, it just kind of reminds me of, you know, like, uh, for instance, Black Sabbath, you know, in the 80s, it did a lot of instrumental openings. And, it, yeah. and like you said, it just sets the mood for what's to come. And, yeah, exactly. And the, the funny thing is the only thing I did not want to do is use is put like a wind sounds or water sounds at the beginning. I mean, I have some water sounds somewhere in the middle because that's what fit a certain song. But at the beginning, right. starting this off, I just wanted it to be, you know, very foreboding and kind of ominous. And, and I think that's, right. you know, it, it kind of works as a bookend because the last song takes a similar approach, but it and uh, well, we'll get to that later. I don't want to go too yeah. much into that. But you're right. It, it there's there's like a bookend quality to it, starting off with an instrumental and ending with one. But I'll, I guess I'll touch on that towards the end if 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 everyone yeah. can stay with us. <laughs> <laughs> and the next one we have is "Before the Fall." Yeah, that that's actually a song I wrote a long a while ago. Some of these songs are actually, you know, kind of old. Well, old is is a relative term, of course. But that one I worked with Scott on, who was the singer who we worked on the last three to four CDs on. And um, so that was the, the last song I worked with him, him uh, a couple of years ago. And so we didn't finish it in time for the last CD. Actually, no, it's not even that old. The music is, is almost that old, but the, the, the song itself with Scott's vocals are not. That probably was maybe five or six years old. So we worked on that five or six years ago. And then I, I and I just, you know, back barned it until I had a, you know, the new CD finished, which of course I didn't think would be 10 years, but so I decided to make that the second song and the first vocal song, because it kind of serves as a, uh, as a tie over it from the days when I was working with Scott on, on a lot of music and he's gotten so busy that he has all these different projects. So working with him is a lot more sporadic now. So I figured that would be a nice way to kind of, bring things over to the working with new singers and new vocalists and new musicians. So I figured that would kind of get a little bit of familiarity with his vocal style and to going into some new directions with the new singers. So that's why I kind of put that song at the front as well as, you know, I always thought it was a, a pretty strong song, although it has a more, I don't want to say it's a jazz fusion vibe, but it has a more progressive rock feel to it than like a metal feel to it. But Right. There's a couple reasons that I figured that would be nice, you know, at the front of the of of the uh, song sequence. Yeah, uh, that's that's one that when I hear it, um, he, his voice has a very familiar feel to it. You know, it's like, um, like for, unlike some uh, prog metal vocals, you know, that they they kind of all started to like copy a certain someone, you know, from uh, Dream Theater. Yeah. They tried to be like him. And he has a more, I, I don't know, it reminds me of 80s metal vocals. Yeah, well, you're actually, you're actually pretty much spot on because Scott's been singing, gosh, you know, I've known him for 30 years and he's, uh, he was actually singing for not surprisingly now your main cover band for many decades. And actually they were really famous on Long Island. They're, they're pretty well known, even though they're now defunct, but, um, he's been singing Iron Maiden for as far back as I can remember. So 
when people say his voice sounds familiar, it, it might be because he sounds a lot like Bruce Dickinson. And, you know, that's where he comes from, that Dickinson Dio vibe. But his voice is pretty versatile as well. And he, he has a lot of range and whatnot. But he definitely comes from a metal background. And um, he's always working on new projects. So that's one of the reasons I, I had this song on there is because, uh, again, it's kind of a bridge. All right, next one up is Siren. Yeah, so that 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 was one of the first songs I was working with uh, some new vocals, and that that's Nina Dorosnik, and um, you know she is a very distinct, different kind of vocal tonality than a lot of other typical progressive metal singers or whatnot. It's, it's kind of gothic. She has a lot of range. She works with a lot of uh, interesting har harmonic structures, so she brings a, a more of a uh, I guess a I guess a gothic rock vibe to it, which uh, you know takes a little bit more for people sometimes to get used to or adjust to. But I think in this case with the songs that we worked on works really well because, um, you know, people, you know, I've only worked with, you know, male singers for a while, although Stephanie Warren did sing on the last song on midnight rising back in 2014. Uh, yeah. 2014. So, you know, Nina was a welcome addition and she was the first new singer I was working with. And I, I just really liked the, the approach she brings to the vocals. She, you know, she writes great lyrics. Um, you know, her, like I said, her vocal range is, is pretty broad and she just has interesting ideas harmonically what works and how to apply that to songs. And in this case, you know, this song, and, um, you know, it's pretty, a pretty standard, I guess, rock song structure, but I think she kind of, you know, elevates it to a degree with her vocal approach. At least that's what I thought. And I, hope other people think so but it's definitely something a little bit different yeah um just kind of nice when they when you uh i mean more and more we have more female vocals in in the progressive metal and progressive rock genre not you it used to be more like backing or occasional but now there's a lot of yeah. them are that are coming way up into the forefront and it's it's kind of nice to see that you know you get that contrast over yeah, absolutely uh, over usually what it usually was a male dominated both of those genres were male dominated yeah ab absolutely man and you know I, I don't discriminate either way you know great singer is a great singer but you know over over the years yes yeah, certainly heavy metal was one of the more was one one of the genres that certainly was more male dominated. There's no question about it. Maybe until I would say like maybe ten or fifteen years ago, and now now there's so many great female singers out there. Yeah. That it you know I mean it's a great thing of course, I and mean, there's there's no negative aspect to that. And next one you got fast and infinite. Oh yeah. So that that's an, yeah that's that's the that's kind of one of the longer instrumental tracks. Um. That, that's the song that starts off with the water and ends with the water, but you know, that kind of fit the, the, the song theme, even though it's, it's an instrumental, you know, it's just, um, and, and that's actually dedicated to some of my friends who unfortunately have passed on over the year, over recent years, which, you know, it's just part of the aging process. You know, people just start, you know, leaving this mortal coil and passing away. But the song, you know, is actually, it's one of my favorites. I, I think, um, the, especially like the bridge section where it breaks down a couple minutes in is, and I, I get a chance to kind of really the solo on it, even though it's, it's not difficult or anything for me, it was one of the most fun parts of the, the song because um, it really just reflects certain emotional qualities that I wanted to bring out in the song, even though it has no lyrics. So for me, even though it's instrumental, I think um, the, the title kind of speaks of where I'm trying to go with it. I know it's a little abstract, but the song has kind of like, has a big, you know, atmospheric vibe to it in spots. So I kind of wanted to, to really bring that out, you know, putting in different textures on the guitar and using a lot of different keyboard sounds and, and going into different, you know, time signatures and, you know, just a lot of movement in the song. So for me, it's actually, you know, one of my personal favorites. And then you got closer to the edge. Yeah, song number five. So that's that's the first song I started working on with uh, Pablo Zucala, who's uh, a great singer from the band Soul Kick in, in Brazil. And um, 
he was one of the other singers that I started working on a couple of tracks with. And um, he, he brought, he brings more of a, of a, I guess, a hard rock, heavy metal, almost a, what you would expect out of a progressive rock singer vibe too, which, you know, of course I like, but it's different at the same time from like what Scott offers. So, you know, he, again, he's bringing a different textural element to his voice and his range and whatnot. So that was a fun song to work on with him because, um, you know, he comes from a, a hard, a more of a hard rock, heavy metal background, but, um, you know, so this song kind of has more of a, a standard metal vibe to it, but it's got, again, you know, the dynamics going on. It has a little, you know, the breakdown sections. He has a little bit of room to breathe with the vocals. So that was kind of a fun song to work on him and push him into doing since uh, it has a bunch of different things going on there. And so, yeah, I really like that one as well. So then uh, the next one is Obelisk. Uh, probably the that's probably the newest song and for that reason it might be my favorite it's another as far as instrumental songs are going only because it's probably the most progressive song on the record it's also an instrumental um it has kind of like that dream theater vibe without being dream theater because i don't have that kind of musical talent or virtuosity that they do but it was a fun song because the main riff of the song I wrote on, on the keyboard probably 20 years ago and I never knew what to do with it. And so in the last, a few years ago, I just started playing around with it. And then, uh, you know, literally within a couple of weeks, I, I had had a whole song out of it. And, uh, you know, it's part of it was written on keyboards. A part was written on guitar. So there's a certain intensity with the guitar parts and the keyboard parts where they trade off or they, they, you know, play in unison. And so, when you're writing on one instrument versus the other, especially since I'm not really a keyboard player, I, I had to, you know, I, I kind of wanted to stab myself in the head a couple of times because working on keyboard lines and transposing that to guitar is not easy in some parts. So while the song was pretty difficult, at least for me to play in spots, it has a lot of progressive elements that I actually like. And at the same time, I think it's a lot more musical. Like it's not being it doesn't have that show off self-indulgent vibe, at least overtly, you know, it, it kind of maintains this certain musical quality where everything sounds like it should be in the same song. And it's not just like going off these different parts that seem just thrown in there. So I think I took a lot of time to try and work these parts in where they sounded natural. So for me, that was, uh, that was kind of fun. Yeah. That's, that's the one thing I, I noticed when I did listen to this, your album is, it's it's not the typical uh, show off type vibe that most progressive metal bands are, and I think I think if anything, your the style is closer to a Fate's Warning style than anything because they they've never really been show off. They just do put where yeah. it's needed, you know, type of thing. And, well, and I, I like that. And that's why I tend to kind of get um, a little more tired after listening to a Dream Theater album than I do, let's say, a Fate's Warning album. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's fun. I, I agree with you 100% on that. I mean, probably my two biggest influences as far as, you know, metal bands are concerned are Fate's Warning and, of course, Queensryche. And, and it's because... And this is not a knack on Dream Theater because they're one of my favorite bands of all time as well. It's, right. it's a different kind of progressive metal. It's much more intense. It's much more musically, I don't want to use the word advanced, but it's certainly more virtuosic. Although, you know, the musicians in Queensryche and Fate's Warning are, are still incredible musicians. But oh, yeah. I guess the what you mentioned is that there's more of a focus on songs and probably more streamlined songs. Not that these bands don't have their occasional epic you know, 10 to 12, 13 minute songs. But, you know, right. there was a focus at some point on kind of streamlining that. And to me, that's one of my favorite things and why I like Queensryche and, and um, Fate's Warning so much is because they do have a much more streamlined musical approach. It's, it's refined, but there's still that really, those really challenging moments in there, which is what a band like Rush is perfected years ago, where you can make things progressive and interesting musically, but at the same time, it's accessible. And sometimes the user, I mean, the listener doesn't even notice, hey, I'm tapping along to the song that's in like 5-8 time or, you know, shifting from 7-8 to 4-4 four, four or whatnot. So, you know, what you mentioned is exactly the kind of approach I take where 
you know, granted, I don't have musical skills anywhere like the guys in Dream Theater, but if I did, I would probably do what they're doing anyway, though. But, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but to be honest, you know, it appeals to me more to kind of see if you can refine those songs and, and song structures and, and kind of just say what you need to say in a 20 minute song in five minutes, if possible. I mean, there's sometimes, and I do it too, where, you know, you do need a, a 10 to 20 minute song and, and it's worth it. And, and if you can pull that off, you know, great. I, I've done it yeah. a couple of times, whether it's successful or not is, is really not for me to determine, but it's definitely a whole different mindset for sure. And then you got the, the one with the longest title, Man Clothed in the Light of the Stars. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's kind of a, uh, I, I, I wrote that song. It's a total, you know, vibe song, I guess you would say. It's, it's actually, it was a new age song I wrote a long time ago and I never knew what to do with it. I knew there'd never be vocals on it, but it serves almost like an interlude. It kind of, it kind of serves as, as a bridge between different song ideas and whatnot, different song structures and, and genres. But even though it started off as kind of a, a, a trance, like, a new age song and I decided you know what it would stick out too much if I just kept it like that so that's where I worked in the guitar parts and kind of made it a little bit more you know heavy metal in, in spots and you know heavied it up so it fit in there but at the same time you still get that trancey interlude vibe to it so for me it's just kind of like of a, a break from the other songs again this is instrumental but that was always the intent and uh it's a very abstract and surreal song, I guess. So um, I figured it was just a nice little centerpiece for the record. Yeah, I, that's what I noticed that. And I think I, I kind of like the fact that it has that the trance vibe to it going on because um, I do like when modern progressive bands bring in outside uh, ideas, uh, you know, from other other genres because if, you know you got a lot of the the ones that they just stick with their formula no matter how dated it may be but they just stick with it and album after album sounds exactly the same and yeah. I mean they're they're great players it's just the um, the ideas they don't have the the right ideas and so that's why I I always welcome people do something a little bit outside of the box, even if it's just a tad, you know, outside, sure. you know, I yeah. mean, one of my, one of my favorite bands, uh, IQ does a lot of that, you know, they added. Yeah. They were, they're an old British band, right? Yeah. Yeah. I remember. And, I, yeah. And they, they, they bring in a lot of the, the newer sounds in, into their, into their music so it's, it's nice when they do that yeah I, i'm 100 percent with you on that again I, we're agreeing too much on this i feel like you know someone's, <laughs> someone's going to yell at us at some point and say okay get a room you guys but right. you're right <laughs> it's funny you mention it ron because the style of music that i'm working on is heavy metal but and progressive in many times but you know when i started working on this genre or merging of styles back in Night, the late 90s early 2000s and you can really hear this all over my first well my, actually my second release virtuality you know the whole intent of me even becoming a songwriter was to merge different styles i mean progressive rock progressive metal heavy metal hard rock those were my that's my forte and that's the foundation but i always wanted to bring in these elements from new age and techno trance music which would are and always were big influences on me so when you say that you like when bands do bring in some style right. list elements of other genres that was the exact reason i got into songwriting all those decades ago because i wanted to do that i'd like these different styles of music and then the the question the quest is well how the hell do i synthesize these things you know merge them together and it's it's trial and error and you know at the end of the day you really have to please yourself first and hope that other people like come on board as so to speak but for me i just right. wanted to merged these music genres together and see what would happen. You know, if other people liked them, great. I hope they would, but I figured, you know, I do it for myself first and kind of see what happened when I threw these right. things against the wall and see what sticks and kind of what doesn't. And um, 
like you said, you know, it, I think it makes it for a more enjoyable, interesting release when you kind of go off what's expected or, you know, deviate from the center, wherever that is. Right. And then come up to the title track, Mindstorm. Yeah. So, yeah, I was, so I was working with a singer, April Rock, who's a, uh, a Lebanese singer. And uh, she has a very distinct, very su sultry kind of voice. And so I guess a little bit more pop oriented, even, even though she does a lot of rock and metal stuff. And um, so she brought this interesting, you know, more pop sensibility to the song, which, you know, was great. Cause when I, when I gave her the song, I didn't really know where to go with it. I'm, you know, I, I don't even write good vocal melodies and that's not my forte. So a lot of times when I'm working with singers, you know, they're working on the melodies and, you know, we'll co-write lyrics and stuff sometimes, whatever works, but usually they're handling the vocal melodies because that's a weak spot for me. And um, so she wrote the vocal melodies and I really like what she did. I mean, it's, it's very succinct and, and dynamic and fits into the song, which, you know, again, goes to these movements, you know, there's that big solo breakdown section in the middle and you get, there's a little bit more of, I guess, I'm not going to say it's funky, but it has a kind of a groove to it almost. And then she goes into this nice sultry kind of scat singing in, in the middle where it breaks down in the, in the middle, I would call it a middle eight, but it's more like a middle 16. So this song is, has a different vibe than the other songs, at least vocally, musically, not so much, but vocally it sounds different, which, you know, is good. You know, if I'm going to work with different singers, I want them all to bring something different to the table. So that was the point. And, you know, I, I'm, I think she did. And I, I really, I really enjoyed, you know, the way this song came out. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's good when you got just the different vocals, you know, I don't want them to all sound the same as what's, what's really the point of having different vocalists. You know? just... Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And now we'll come up to No Turning Back, which is the longest song. Yeah. <laughs> I guess every release, you know, I, I have to keep my progressive credentials in there. So at least I have to have at least one epic or long song on, on every album I do. So this is the one, you know, I mean, obviously this is probably the most cinematic song because you have these, these big sections, like the first couple minutes is a total new age song. Then you have the, the main song, then it breaks down into a new age song with the solo, you know, have, you have these cinematic qualities. It goes back to the, um, to the chorus and verse and whatnot again towards the end. And then, uh, so this one just goes to the movements that I really like. And this is what I was talking about earlier when I was talking about, you know, when you write a, an epic that you want to hope that it sounds like it's cohesive and it, it makes sense. It's not just like parts thrown together. You know, although I have to admit there's occasionally some songs I like that are like that. But again, for me, this, this is the way I like to work. You know, I like to have kind of a structure and, you know, so it's almost like a, a typical, typically structured song, but it's, it's blown out. It's kind of exaggerated. It has, it takes a more epic form. And so, and this song probably is the most overtly political song on there without being overtly political, but lyrically, you know, it touches into a lot of themes that I find kind of important for the last, you know, probably six, seven, eight years. So without, you know, going into specifics or specific political ideologies and whatnot, but the song, I think for me, taps into things that I find important lyrically. And so that in that respect, the song is a lot different than other songs too, where it's kind of really has a political sociological, you know, vibe to the, to the, uh, you know, content. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, I've noticed that there's a lot of those type of songs out there now, especially since, uh, since the pandemic, especially, you know, it just so it seems like in our lifetime, we had two major events that really changed how we look at things, 9-11 and the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Before 9-11, yeah. before I mean, we saw little, little changes, but nothing that was obviously right in your face type of thing. And um, but then 9-11, that, that changed everything. You know, because up, up until that point, I just noticed how it's, I don't know, I wouldn't say business as usual, but it just everything just kind of flowed nicely. And all of a sudden we had that obstruction. And since that point to the pandemic, 
we look at the world differently. Um, we were, you know, obviously not, after 9-11, we are a little more scared of things than we were before. I mean, before people were still scared, but now they were really scared. And after, after uh, the pandemic, people are really scared. Some, uh, some for good reason and some for not. Yeah. And, but, and that's, I, I just noticed, especially after the music after the pandemic seems to be a little, uh, little stronger uh, theme wise, you know, they uh, touching upon all different things, whether it's uh, for the society at large, or if it's something that personally happened, you know, so. Well, yes. And, and that's, you know, and, and the lyrics to this were written post um, well during and post uh, COVID pandemic. So, some of that stuff does actually feed into the lyrics. So that's exactly what I was, you know, looking at and, and kind of I right. ascertained about in, in my observations of, of people and the way they dealt with these things. And so that's kind of funny that it wound up in the songs. I really didn't intend it to be like that, but you know, that's the way things work out creatively sometimes, but it, it taps into a lot of the things you just said. Right. Yeah. Now you're going to have to help me with the next song. The, uh, right. Yeah. McLan to Cootley. So, and repeat after me, McLan to Cootley. McLan to Cootley. So, Ron, it's the, um, it's the Aztec God of Death. Um, okay. Yeah. You can, you can look that up too. Um, it, it's actually a song. I, it's a song title that was originally, it was, it was my band back going back to like the late eighties. I, when I was studying, um, uh, mythology and Aztec and Egyptian mythology were some of the mythology I, I loved so much back in, in the late eighties and nineties. And so I always thought, oh, that'd be a great band name. So, and I'm like, oh, you know, maybe a song name too. So eventually I had the chance to, uh, emblazon it on a song that had no title because um the song make land cthulhu is originally supposed to have vocals too but we never found something that could fit in so i'm like you know what i'll just put it i'll just this has this has an interesting vibe where it might fit into the make land cthulhu title that i have and especially that one section after the the intro and the verse where it goes in like this kind of middle eastern or exotic sounding scale and has kind of a sinister vibe in spots including at the right. end i'm like you know what this is this is McLean Cthulhu, whether it wants to be or not. So that's what I did. I, I made the song earn that title, and that's why it has that name after the Aztec God of Death. <laughs> yeah, you know, mythology is a great uh, source of uh, inspiration. I got to say, you know, whether you're yes. a musician or not, you know, just inspiring for you know, learning about how how different civilizations worshipped and dealt with their everyday lives, you know. Some of them back then, I mean, I was just about to say some of them were a little bit too afraid of things like that, but I think they're afraid of things like that now. So it's, it's, it's just a different thing. Instead of having many, there's just one, depending on who you what you call them, you know, and I, I, it's really cool. I, I really love it when bands go into mythology, whether it's uh, Aztec, Egyptian, you know, uh, Norse, you know, whatever, it, the, you know, Japanese, you know, you can find so many different things uh, out there. And, um, it is, man. It's 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 fascinating. I mean, I mean, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but you know, all, to me, all religions really are mythology. If you want to, you know, analyze right. them down down to the core and down to the foundation. But and that's funny you say that because if I was going to write lyrics to McLean Cthulhu, I don't even know what I would have wrote lyrics about. I mean, I probably would have came up, figured something out, but it's you're probably you're probably correct when you, it, it is interesting but it's even better for me when i don't have to write lyrics to an instrumental right. song i don't know what the hell it would be about <laughs> you know i just thought of it it's you know if if you did wrote 
right lyrics for it. It would have to almost be horror themed. Yeah. Uh, right. And not not necessarily horror movie, but horror themed. You know, where it just uh, probably would fit into maybe vibes of that um, that movie uh, Apocalypto. Yes, you know, which I just watched for the third, fifth time a couple of months ago. Yeah, when I first saw that, I thought I was just, it was just kind of, I, I like the fact that they were using the old, that old language. You yeah. Know, and, and how hard that must have been to, for the, for the actors to learn, you know, most of the actors to learn it, you know, because I think it's pretty much been a dead language. For the most part, yeah. I mean, it brought some authenticity to it, which was great, and just yeah. showed how they, they took this, the the themes that they were presenting. So, yeah, I I, agree. I think that's a great thing. For, for some reason, something like that. I I think that uh, if someone were to be with English words, I don't think the movie would have came across as well. Yeah, I don't think either. That was kind of a selling point for sure. If and if I remember, it was that it was using you know, using the tongue that was you know appropriate for the era, and so I think that was one of the things that made it a lot more, you know, legitimate and and, and interesting. Yeah. So that will probably have been how the lyrics for. <laughs> and yes, you know, trying to yes. teach someone to those words. Oh, those absolutely. words were good. Yeah, watch yeah. this movie and understand. <laughs> right. And it's funny you mentioned the horror horror movies and just horror genre in general, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, H.P. Lovecraft. And um, the introduction, the first minute of, of the so well, yeah, the first minute of the first song, you know, um, Servants of Shadow actually is is like my musical. I guess calling to H.P. Lovecraft because the gra the graphics for the uh, for the single version I wrote, actually, it has a very lovecraftian uh artistic vibe to it so and that was when i wrote that part with the big ominous trumpet like sound and that dark vibe that's actually my homage to uh, hp lovecraft even though it's just about a minute or two long <laughs> all, right. Hey. all right the next song you have is uh distant yeah so that was actually, actually, I'm sorry, this was the first one I wrote with Nina. Simon was the second one. So this thing was the first song she did. And I, I love the lyrics too. It's a, it's kind of a, a slower, but very dark uh, song. You know, it's got, it's very moody. The, the, it, it builds up like so many other songs that I write do, but this one like really has kind of a, a more of a, a slow burn quality too. And she does some, some really cool, you know, vocal transitions and, harmonics on it which I, and harmonies on it which i really like so this song was um the first one was like yeah I, i'm gonna enjoy working with nina because she's bringing something that i didn't even expect to the table and um that was both the lyrics and the and the song and the um, vocal parts and uh i like the interplay there so i'm like this was the like the touch point for us to work together and uh so it's actually one of my favorite vocal songs on it just because it's it's got a very gothic dark vibe to it and the lyrics really fit with the mood of the song and I was really really happy with that that's that's really um, again I like that you had the different vocalists and that they brought the, their flavor the, their flavor into uh, and that you know there's a lot of times uh, people that you know such as yourself that have the band idea, you, you tend to be like very, um, well, it's cost, in a way, kind of a claustrophobic towards them, where you, you said, no, you, you can only stay right in here, you know, and I like when, basically how you're saying, that you basically let them do what they needed to do. And yeah, and you know, it's funny because when I'm working with singers, it's pretty much all the time, the music's almost always done. It's always, hey, here's the music. Now you got to, here's your job. You got to put vocal lines, lyrics, and melodies to this. So the music's always done. So 
it's up to them where they want the vocals to go, how they want to do it. And then we kind of go back and forth and, and, you know, work on and refine what's happening. You know, maybe it doesn't work there or maybe we should move something around, but that's where the singers really get to experiment and try different things that the music's done. They have this, these parameters, this structure, and then they just have to fit their, do their thing within the confines of the song. So sometimes I mean, that can be a hard thing to work with sometimes, but sometimes it, by the same token, it gives them a lot more freedom to try different things because there's a lot of, sometimes there's different things going on musically. And then you got the, the final song, Event Horizon. Yeah, which is the bookend, the, the bookend to the opening piece. And this one's an instrumental again. It's, you know, it's, it's, only three or four minutes long so i guess it's one of the shorter songs and it kind of serves as the other end the, the closing statement of the of the album whereas you know um servants of shadow and um new dawn was the opening statement this is the closing statement and it's it's kind of cool in that it starts off kind of like a has that build like a progressive metal song it's going to burst into your living room and then it kind of breaks down into this really spacey section and it just goes through a couple space like trance movements until it fades out at the end. And, and it, Lee, I think it ends the, the album on like a very, not a happy tone, but a very mysterious one. Not necessarily happy, definitely not happy, not necessarily morose or somber, but kind of a more mysterious vibe, I right. think. That's what I was going for, which you know, was what I wanted to do since it started off in a dynamic fashion, very powerful in your face. I wanted to end it on a more esoteric manner. And I think that's what this song meant to do. It just kind of, it, it fades out slowly and then you're just kind of left floating in space, not really sure of what's happening, where you're going, what's supposed to happen. And so that was the whole, I guess, strategy of, of, these two songs being the bookends of the of the actual album. Right. Well, you know, in real life, that's pretty much how a lot of things end. They don't really end. They go to the next, whatever the next thing is going to become. Yeah. And so it's like when, in the old, old days when they ended off the thing, they always used to end it off either on a good note or, or a completely bad note. And it's like, life doesn't, isn't like that. It's, they leave you off on a note, you know, it's like, and then it's up to, basically up to you to decide where the story continues from, you know, yeah, I, I guess, that. I guess in a way, some people might call it a cliffhanger. I yeah, mean, you're right. But, I mean, you're right. I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, that's that's just something, and that's what I like because, especially if if a band likes to continue themes, at least gives them an opening that you know, maybe you know, maybe not in the next album, but maybe albums down the line, they want to come back to that theme again. You know, as a you know, like a lot of bands like to do is sequels. Yeah, uh, some of them are good, and some of them are really bad. <laughs> right there's not a lot of middle ground there sometimes for sure right <laughs> and i mean and it, it just ends ends it off perfectly i think I mean, that's yeah i mean well thank you for that i, I thought so i, I kind of wanted to end it end it on a kind of a, like you said a cliffhanger something that's a little ambiguous something that doesn't tell you or like direct you in a way like you just you're just left hanging like you said life is like that you're not really being told what's happening. You're just left to come to kind of wonder. And I think that's an interesting place to be. And, and, you know, not everything needs to have like a statement that says, this is where we are. This is what you're doing. It's just left to let you figure out, is this exactly. going to go somewhere? Maybe it's not, maybe we're just left to float here. I mean, you're right. Life's like that sometimes as we both know, and, you know, knowing you personally for many years, I know, you know, exactly what we're talking about. Right. Whatever it is in life, sometimes you just don't know, and and that's okay. You know that that's there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes, yeah. So, you know, if you guys haven't already got it, it's just it's brand new out, but uh, you can get it on his Bandcamp. Uh, and, yeah, I do. It's where I, you know, there's a bunch of spots. Uh, but I, I, I basically, I, I always like to let people 
tell people this. Buy it, whether it's actual physical media or digital, because this way uh, it does two things. It puts money in Scott's pocket. And then it also tells them that, well, maybe it is worth it for me to do these. You know, because yeah. um, so it's it's a it's a twofold uh, statement by buying it. I mean, and then you know when you buy it on Bandcamp, uh, you, what you do is you download their their app, and you can listen to it wherever you're at. You know, on sure. your on your phone, tablet, whatever. Um, so it's it's portable because in case you don't like to. Uh, carry around CDs, you know, nowadays, that's just, uh, I know, I, I, I was telling someone, I said, you know, I have a stack of CDs that what I do is I put them onto a, a thumb drive so that I yeah. can keep them in my car that way. I uh, used to be able to bring out 10 or have one of those CD wallets. And I was afraid that they might get lost or someone looks in your car and says, oh, that, that should be mine. And, and the, uh, cause I've heard, I had friends tell me all, all the time that used to have CDs in the car and got broken in too. And, and said, well, you know, now and that, we got the conveniences. Yes, absolutely. That I've been down that road many times and you know, it's funny. I do the same thing. I, I have a, I actually, my car is old enough where I still have a CD player, but I also have an MP3 connection to it. So I do the same thing as well. I just put stuff onto an MP3 player or even on my phone, connect the phone to the car and know you're ready to go. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, uh, it's, 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 con- I, I get it. People are looking for convenience now, nowadays because they can't really bring their, I mean, even uh, the portable CD player is, is in a way kind of inconvenient, even though. Yeah, it is. You're they're right. Coming, they're coming. They're coming back. I, I noticed that. Uh, I had a friend of mine whose daughter, who was like twelve, asked her, asked him, "Can I get a, a one of those portable CD players? You know, like the thing you had a long time Bring ago." Bring back the Walkman. Yeah, and uh, I was like, "Wow, okay," you know. That's cool. I mean, because we need to, we need to ignite their their wanting to have something that they actually own. You know. And- I know we grew up in an interesting time where you know we see we saw all these technological technological changes in in the medium of how music is distributed and presented. So um, and you know we're also lucky because in the heavy metal, progressive rock. And all those genres that they overlap, you know, there's still people that love to have the physical product and that's where CDs come in line. And as a graphic designer, because that's my day job is I do design for a living. So I'm all about that physical product because there's something when you have that tangible, tactile piece of whatever the medium it is in your hand, DVD, music, CD, album, whatever. you, You have that pride of ownership. You know, it just feels like, you know, you're part of something. And even though, you know, I'm, and I can say this as an independent musician, and I think almost any other musician or even artist in general will agree. We don't really, there's not much money to be made or to have on. In fact, you know, even when I make money off this, I never even break even because, you know, I have production costs and distribution, marketing, all that. But, that, but that's not the point. A lot of us, most of us do it because we love it and people in the show <laughs> their, their enthusiasm of buying it or just supporting it in any way. That's really kind of, makes it all worthwhile and it, you know i'd love to of course i'd love to be mil- making millions but um i'm just a diy independent musician self-financed so even if people want to enjoy it digitally hey just enjoy it and tell me what you think and at the end of the day you know i'm i think like a lot of people and i'll fully admit it i do this mostly for myself because it's self-expression and i think anyone who who's a, an artist in any way shape or form just wants to express himself. If people like it and enjoy it and want to support it, that's great, man. I mean, I love that. That kind of spurs you on and serves like to really encourage you to do more. And it's like a give back, give and take relationship. Right. And, you know, and what's cool uh, when you do buy the CD, you get these 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. And one, and one, one has the right here has the, al the yes. album information, and then the other one has this. It's one. like the marketing, yeah, the marketing firm. So that's the that's the advantage of being a graphic artist. I can design all the uh, promotional pieces and tie them into the actual release, and it's almost like. Yeah. I mean, it's a glorified keepsake, but I thought it just gives you a little bit more enticement to, hey, I have a physical product and I have these postcards. And that collector's item or anything, but they're cool to have and it just kind of encapsulates oh, yeah. the product. Well, it show, it, you know, it also shows that, you know, people, I, I have a, a bunch of different keepsakes like that. And it's one of these days, I mean, I like to put them up on my wall, but I don't, I want to get frames for them. yeah right you know you need a frame from you know because i definitely i have i have some things on my wall as you can, as you can see a couple record um, albums yeah and um actually this right here is a, a tour and this one is a promo uh, where they nice. send it out to the record labels a friend of mine got that for me years ago uh at the Pasadena City College swap meet. Uh, <laughs> not far from me. Um, and he got that for me. He said, oh, I think he's gonna like it you know, for my birthday. And it's, at the time, I didn't really know I was in bed. I known about rocks and music, but then afterwards I became. Um, it's, it's fun to be able to have those kind of things and you know, just, you know, because I know there's a lot of collectors that they would put them up on the wall. And, yeah, definitely. You know, and just to decorate the walls because, you know, it's, it's fun decorating the walls. Yes, it is, especially if you have boring blank walls or old, old, old wallpaper that you just got to cover up. Exactly. <laughs> so, you can, like, again, uh, you can buy the CD um, and the digital download at, uh, at Scott's Bank Camp, and I'll put the link down below. And uh, you can also get the rest of his uh, albums, um, most of them on, on, uh, for digital. Uh, yeah, they're all on CD and digital, so you know you can so, you know, choose, choose which or both if you're feeling adventurous. Yeah, and also too, is if you do buy them on there, you get the you get the the digital download with it, so it's like you're getting, you know, two for one, you know, two for one, <laughs> pretty much. Right, let's make life a little bit easier because then you don't have to put the CD in your computer and go through the whole, you know, process of right. loading it, downloading it, yeah, all that stuff. Right. Well, Scott, I I wanted to say thanks for finally coming on. Um, I appreciate it. Um, known each other for we go back a couple years ron absolutely man you, you're one of the yeah. first guys all those years ago i was sending our releases to back in the day yeah i think in the early 2000s yes absolutely yeah, back, when I was, back when i was in your neck of the woods <laughs> <laughs> right it's funny where life takes us just a couple years later but here you are yeah. you know one of the guys who's been doing it for this long and still doing it right yeah, I'm, I'm I'm amazed at that myself too. <laughs> yeah, which is you know, which is awesome. But you know, it's fun. That's what it has to be at the end of the day. Exactly, and and I'm glad that you're still making music. Yeah, man, it takes a little bit longer and a little bit more effort, but you know, like with what you do, it it's really it just has to be fun. All right, Scott. Well, you know, uh, it's good seeing you finally. I mean, I've seen your pictures on Facebook and everything, but never actually spoke. It's good to finally get to do that. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's true because a lot of us, we know each other online. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a big, but it's a small community, but a lot of us really only know each other through the internet, which, you know, is great. And that that's actually awesome. But when you do have these chances to connect and put a face or a voice to the uh, internet presence, that's always a good thing for sure. Oh, yeah. And you're uh, welcome back to 
channel anytime uh, next time you have it now or for anything else. You got it, Ryan. And you know we'll be speaking on Facebook with, with political stuff search, probably within the next couple hours. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Of course, of course. So, yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll still be in touch. But hopefully it won't take another 10 years no matter what happens. But, you know, we'll see oh, what happens. Yeah. You know, I'm in All PR right. mode right now, which is annoying. But, you know, that's part of the process, you know. Exactly. All right. Well, thanks again, man. And uh, talk with you soon. Thank you, Ron. Don this is so, you know, I'm so not used to doing this, but, you know, I, I greatly appreciate you getting me on here. It's just awesome. I don't oh, get yeah. to as much as I, as I enjoy it. It, it, it is really fun. All right. All right. Thanks again. Okay, man. Talk to you soon. All right. All right bye. Bye.